Hey everybody, how's it going? My name is Chris and behind me is my dream woodworking shop. I've been working really hard on this thing for over a year now. I'm getting really close to finishing and one of the main and final projects that I wanted to do was build a timber frame lean-to on this side and as you can see that's what I did and that's what this video is about. So if you're not familiar with timber framing it's kind of the traditional way of building using large timbers and interlocking joinery to hold the structure together. It's not like modern building where everything's nailed or screwed together. There's lots of mortise and tenons, scarf joints, dovetail joints, things like that that go into a timber frame. Now with modern timber framing you still do use some hardware for like securing the rafters to the top beam here, securing the bottom of the post to my footers and all sorts of things like that. And for that I'm using PowerPro hardware and I'm also using Osco hardware for this timber frame and they're both sponsored this video. So I want to thank them and we'll jump right into it. Let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is head over to a local sawmill and get the timbers I need to build this thing. I'm using spruce for this lean-to because it's what the Sawyer had on hand and based on its structural characteristics, it's a perfectly suitable species to build this lean-to out of. Now I'm not gonna get into a ton of detail here about species, but Eastern white pine and Doug fir are probably the two most common and favorite species to build out of depending on your geographical location and white spruce is very similar to eastern white pine. Now there's been years and years of research and data collected and engineering charts that lay out the structural characteristics of all sorts of different wood species and the required sizes and allowable spans for the loads that they'll experience and all that fancy stuff. And it's really important, especially if you're building a house, to understand all that and choose the right timbers and sizes for your building. The first thing I do when I get the timbers home is to take a couple passes on each face with this 7 inch Triton hand planer to knock the rough saw marks out. Now I know a lot of people like the rough sawn look, but for me I think laying the joinery out is more accurate and easy on cleaned surfaces and it doesn't soak up nearly as much finish when I apply that later on and dust, dirt and cobwebs don't stick to those clean surfaces nearly as well as if they're rough sawn. I'm going to start with my posts and I'm using 6 by 6s for those and all this lumber is still green or wet. It's a lot easier cutting wood while it's wet and in timber framing that's the preferred way to go. You want to work as quickly as possible to cut and then assemble your frame and once it's locked all together and finish is applied it can slowly dry over time and you won't have any problems. I'll do an initial inspection on every piece and I'm going to look for defects and find what face that I want on the outside and I'm also going to look for major knots or cracks that I want to avoid. That's why when ordering timbers it's a good idea to order them long so that you have some room to move things around. After careful layout I'm going to cut my post to length and I'm really going to focus on cutting to my line to ensure that they're perfectly square. I'm using a silky Zorin Japanese handsaw that is super sharp and has aggressive crosscut teeth. It works perfect for these kind of cuts. Now I do have a giant 16 inch skill saw, circular saw that would be great for these cuts, but I also just like using hand tools and if you follow my channel you'll know that, but later on I do use that circular saw for when I have to cut all my rafters. Now I'm going to carefully lay out all the joinery of my posts. There's going to be tenons at the top and knee brace mortises on the sides. For joinery, I'm always going to use a marking gauge or a marking knife for my layout and then I'll darken the line with a pencil. Then I'll cut just shy of my line on all my joinery and then I'll use my chisels and my slicks to finish those cuts. The knife line will help prevent tear out from my really aggressive saw or drill bits and it's also going to give me a super accurate groove to drop my chisel edge into for that final cut. One of the most effective ways to remove waste on these tenons is to just split the wood away. The wood is really weak in this orientation and I can remove a lot of waste at a time. I added that additional cross cut to help me keep those split off pieces of wood under control. If I was to split off that whole piece, the grain could dive below my desired line and take off too much material. This way I can sneak up and watch which way the grain is going and avoid any problems.
Once I get close to my line, I'm gonna switch over to a slick, which is just a long handled chisel that you push through the wood rather than strike with a mallet, and I'm gonna work across the grain to get my final surface. Then to finish the tendon shoulders, I'm just gonna drop my chisel into that knife line and carefully chop down. The human eye is actually really good at naturally seeing square, so it's pretty easy after a little bit of practice to just stand back a little bit, look in line with your chisel, and make a nice square cut. Then I'm going to move on to the knee brace mortises. Now I use a large Forstner bit to remove the bulk of the waist, and then I'm just going to work to my line with my chisels and slicks. On the house that I'll build and any other frames that I do later on, I'd really like to get a chain mortiser, which is basically a mini chainsaw that's on a plunge router type frame that can cut one of these mortises super fast. Unfortunately, they're really expensive, and I didn't have a whole lot of mortises on this lean-to, so I didn't pull the trigger on it this time. Next it's time to work on the 6x8 pieces that are going to make up the beam. First I'll use this jig that I made to lay out the scarf joints and these scarf joints will allow me to take four shorter timbers and connect them end to end in such a way that makes them super strong and gets me the full 50 feet of beam length that I need. Now there's a lot of different types of scarf joints out there, as simple as just two angles that meet together with some glue, but this particular scarf joint is called an undersquinted stop splayed scarf joint with table and wedges. It's super strong and it's pretty common in timber frames. I'll use a combination of power tools and hand tools on this. I'll remove a lot of the waste with the power tools and then get my nice final finish with hand tools. It's important to take your time and work carefully and slowly to your lines, and I'm always making sure that I work inward towards the middle of my joints from both sides that way I don't blow out one side or the other. So I'm sure I'll get some questions about the tools that I'm using and my sharpening system so I'll just put some links to that and some information as to what I did and what I used down in the description so if you're interested go check that out down there. Once all my scarfs and mortises are cut on my beams, I'll move on to the knee braces. I'm just going to use my miter saw for my 45 degree cuts all the way through, and I'll use my circular saw for my shoulder and cheek cuts. Now the circular saw can't cut full depth on the cheek cut, so I'll use my Ryoba saw to finish that off, and then finish working to my lines with my slick. Now at the bandsaw, I'm going to add decorative curves to my knee braces and I'm going to make sure that I don't remove more than a third of the width of those braces. 
Next are the rafters. Now these are pretty simple, but there's a lot of them, and so I used a jig to lay out my bird's mouth where the rafter is going to sit on the ledger board and where it's going to sit on the beam. I use my large Ryoba saw to cut to the line on my back cut and then just use a slick to pare away the rest. After trying a few different methods on these, I found that this was the quickest and most enjoyable way to cut these. On the post, I'm adding a chamfer using a router starting and sapping about 6 inches from the end, and then it's time to start staining the wood. I'm going to be using an exterior oil-based stain by TWP in a cedar tone color. It's going to help me match the spruce to the cedar shake siding that I already added to the barn and protect this wood for years to come. And one of the nice things about oil stain is I don't have to strip it to reapply. I can just go right over the top and give it a new coat whenever it needs. Now my last pieces to work on are my ledger boards. I'm using 4x6s and I decided to route out grooves to fit over the ribs on the siding rather than cutting my siding out and mess around with a bunch of flashing and J-channel. Because the edge is protected by the existing eave and there's a lot of airflow up there, I have zero worries about any kind of water problems. And it ended up looking really nice. All right, so here are the fasteners that I'm using on this timber frame to connect my ledger board and the blocks that support my ledger board to the side of the building. I'm using these big eight inch construction lag screws by PowerPro. Now to connect my rafters to the ledger board and to the beam, I'm using these eight inch timber tights and I have to pre-drill and countersink these about halfway into my rafter up top so that I can clear the eaves because it's so nice and tight underneath that eave. But I'm able to use this angled drill bit holder and drive that down the rest of the way. Works out really nice. For my purlins to my rafters, I'm using a five inch premium exterior screw by PowerPro. I've used tons and tons of their screws over the years for interior and exterior work. They're awesome. There's a lot of actually really cool technology in these things that prevent splitting. And once you drive them in, they're held in place and they don't back out really nice. And for the sheet metal roof, I'm using their sheet metal screws and they got a really nice drill bit tip that I like. It bores through that metal really quickly and a washer that helps seal any moisture or water from going through that into the wood. Now to add a little bit of extra security to my rafters, I'm adding these two inch rafter clips by a company called Osco that makes all sorts of really nice timber framing hardware. So if you don't wanna do mortise and tenons and you wanna just build it a lot quicker, they make some really beautiful and cool hardware to help hold all that stuff together. I'm also using their six inch base plates to attach my posts to the footers. So big thank you to PowerPro and Osco for sponsoring this video. Go check out their stuff down in the description. Now let's jump into using some of this hardware and getting this timber frame stood up. Now I'm going to attach the ledger board supports and the ledger board. I'm using the big 8 inch PowerPro construction screws and I'm going to go all the way through the supports and directly into the barn post 
that are behind that sheet metal exterior. Now that my ledger board is up, I'll attach my Osco post base plates to my footers and then I can start laying out my components to assemble this thing and start standing it up. So I designed this lean-to in a way that would make standing it up easy with just a few guys. My first section has two posts and a longer beam section which will be able to stand up and it can support itself. Then the other sections have just one post attached to the beam section and we can stand that up and connect it to the other beam with the scarf joints and this method worked out really really well. This was such an exciting and rewarding time, I can't even tell you. After so much work and time cutting all these individual pieces, you get to put them all together like a giant wood puzzle and it feels incredible when your plan and your layout and your joinery all fit like they should. And I also want to stop and thank my friends and family who helped me cut and raise this thing. I really appreciate those who came and helped me. Here I'm getting my timber tight screws started on the top of the rafters so that they'll fit underneath the eaves. I'm getting these prepared so that when we stand up the frame I can attach a couple rafters to the ledger board and the beam and it'll hold that first section in place. Most of the time people will peg their tenons while the frame is on the ground, but I wanted to wait until the frame was standing and make sure everything was nice and square. And since I didn't lift these things with a crane or anything like that, it was fine doing it this way. These are not drawboard, which is when you offset the holes going through the mortise and tenon, and those will pull that joint together. It's just too much hassle assembling and disassembling the timbers to go through that draw boring layout process. And I think the majority of timber frames don't actually draw bore. As long as your joints are nice and tight to start, you're going to be perfectly fine. So once I'm squared and pegged, I secure the bottom of the post to my base plates. These Osco bases are really heavy duty, look really nice, and have a great design that allowed the post to be up to a true 6 inches and down to 5.5 inches, which is what a dimensional 6x6 that you get from a lumber yard is. They secure on all four sides and have an extremely strong uplift force rating, and you can get them in a couple different styles and sizes all the way up to 10x10 posts. Now with the rest of the sections, I only have one post per beam section, and so we have to lift that up and set it into place on the scarf joint. Now you might be wondering why the scarfs aren't located directly over the posts. Well the proper way to orient these with the least amount of stress on that joint is to have it out over the knee brace or a little bit past it. If you imagine a wet noodle hanging over the post, there's going to be crowns over the post and dips between the posts. Now there's a lot of compression 
tensile and shear stresses going on at those spots, but the area between the post top and the middle span has very little. That's why engineers recommend placing scarfs above or close to the braces. Ready, go for it. Slide my way. Okay. Once the final section is in place, I go back and I add the rest of my rafters. I added a rafter roughly every 30 inches, which is probably way more than I structurally needed for just snow loads and things like that. But I thought it would look really nice, so I went ahead and did it anyway, and I'm really happy I did because I think it looks absolutely amazing. Now it's time to attach my purlins. Again, I'm using 5-inch Power Pro exterior screws and true 2x4 lumber that I had the sawmill mill up for me. And the last thing to do is just attach my metal roofing and trim and it's all done. Well everyone, I wanna say thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned something too. The plan is to next build a timber frame eyebrow over the front door as well as the garage door. And next year I plan on building a small timber frame barn out here at the property as well as our house and garage in the spring of 2023. And we're gonna hold week long classes for that small barn and our house. So if you're interested in that, make sure you stay tuned. And if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and feel free to go check out my website where I have merchandise and lots of cool woodworking plans. Thanks again to PowerPro and Osco for sponsoring this video and we'll see you on the next one.